Oui, oui. Test. Test. Okay. Oh, okay. oh, if you want, I can jump on the app as well. Pour the water. Okay, cool. Thanks. This is like more than enough. Thank you. My my mic. Oh wow. Okay, cool. Fancy here. That's right. Um, and then, however, today we're really excited to have Cliff to give us uh, uh, our last time uh, about double double copy variants uh, variations. Uh, uh, I introduced Cliff already yesterday in the colloquium, but uh, very briefly, uh, Cliff is a professor at uh, Caltech, and he's really championing many different. Uh, 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 particle physics, uh, uh, in particular, uh, is recent exciting journey in the amplitudes, uh, uh, which many interesting and nice results and understanding. So I think he will show us some technical development along this line. Please go ahead. Great. So uh, again, thank you very much, Jen, for for inviting me today, and, th and thank you for having me to this uh, this uh, technical seminar. Actually, the timing works out great because. Uh, I can almost dispense with a lot of the usual generalities because I already gave a colloquium, which is like a, usually like the intro 10 minutes of a technical talk. So I will be a little more brief, hopefully 
uh, at least some of you saw the colloquium yesterday. But um, basically, if I could summarize everything I said yesterday uh, rather concisely, it's that scattering amplitudes, okay, quantum amplitudes, are a, a very useful, powerful diagnostic for just finding structure. Okay? This has long been known, but I think in maybe the last uh, 10 years or so, there's been kind of genuine new progress in this direction. Okay? I think a famous example of this, of course, is how string theory was born, which is really through uh, uh, understanding scattering amplitudes and, and, and really the properties of functions. Okay? So here is a completely uh, a non-exhaustive list of some of the things that have shown up in say the last 10, 15 years or so, which are new structures that uh, really originated in some shape or form at the level of scattering. Okay? I'll mention them and then focus on one in particular. So uh, one, one uh, very interesting example is something called dual conformal symmetry, which, ha which has, to ha has to do with the fact that gluon scattering amplitudes actually exhibit a second conformal symmetry when expressed in the right variable. This is a symmetry where uh, essentially momentum space is kind of reinterpreted as a certain position space. There's another set of developments that I won't talk about here, which is- Please ask you to mention the names of the discoveries of the right, phenomenon. Right. Right, so these are the more modern uh, 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 developments. So I will, let, me say their, let me say their names uh, as, as we go. So I think dual conformal symmetry came from uh, folks like uh, Drummond. It was later understood by people like uh, Juan Maldacena using things like fermionic T-duality. The amplitudehedron is something you probably heard in, in the popular press, is a statement that you can actually reinterpret amplitudes not just as things like Feynman diagrams, but actually as volumes of abstract polytopes in certain auxiliary spaces. So the idea is you imagine there's some other auxiliary set of variables and a volume in that space actually is the amplitude. This is work uh, 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 including Nimar and Kani Ahmed and Jaroslav Trinka and others. Uh, uh, another a set of ideas that have really kind of uh, kicked into play in the, maybe the last couple of years or so, especially, is something called celestial uh, CFT or celestial amplitudes. This is something that actually has origins all the way back to VP Nair when he first saw the Park-Taylor formula that I showed you in my colloquium yesterday, who observed that the correlation functions in these gauge theories actually have the properties or the structure of conformal field theories. More recently, this has been understood by uh, folks like Andy Strominger and people in their circle uh, as signs perhaps of a putative conformal field theory on the sky. This is, uh, this is the way of saying, that they imagine looking at the two-dimensional surface, uh, which is angles in the sky in uh, a four-dimensional world, and that the correlators uh, uh, engaged there in gravity actually look, uh, sorry, the, the amplitudes engaged there in gravity actually look like correlation functions of a certain CFT. Okay. Now, the, the thing that I want to focus on uh, in today's talk has to do with what I spent a lot of yesterday's colloquium talking about, which was this gauge squared equals gravity, which is a so-called double copy. So this is yeah. an amplitude, that, that's just yeah. for uh, CFTs. Uh, is that just for CFTs? Yeah, so the idea is that um, there is this, uh, I, I'm not sure if, what you mean by if it's just for CFTs. The point is that if you take uh, a gauge theory or a gravity theory that is not a CFT in flat space, that it looks like a correlator of a possible oh, lower dimensional CFT. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, so in the sense, the two-dimensional uh, setup is a CFT in their picture. Yeah, so I could be maybe a little more explicit, but in this picture, there's a mapping between things like soft theorems and scattering amplitudes and conformal word identities on the other side. So there's a very kind of rich dictionary. There's some also odd confusions, especially recently where people have found that the OPE, oh, let me, just, let me explain this a little bit more. In the CFT, you might ask, what is the OPE of the CFT? And it's actually, collinear singularities on the sky. So it's collinear divergences, which would define the OP because it's uh, 2D OP on the sky. And more recently, they've discovered kind of some oddities with the associativity of that OP. There's still confusions getting worked out, but basically it boils down to taking the SL2C of Lorentz, treating it like the conformal group and thinking about it like a CFT. But basically yeah. QCD could be described by a 2 CFT. Yeah, so, so that's one side of it. In fact, there's a whole nother program uh, that is being initiated by, uh, by a, a uh, Jesse Thaler and uh, another person, I'm forgetting his name, he just joined the faculty at Yale, where they take uh, correlation functions, energy correlators, and they interpret them also in terms of the CFT, and they're trying to say things about jet uh, observables at LHC. So this is, a, this is a rich story. That actually isn't an amplitude in that case. But there's a whole bunch of kind of interesting structures that, that this is really just in the last, uh, uh, even this stuff is last like five, less than 10 years from now. 
Now, uh, uh, the thing I want to focus on in this talk is a very specific form of gauge squared equals gravity duality, which was BC and J's uh, a finding, which has two pieces, which I mentioned yesterday. And I'll say it in words and then really show you the explicit formulas. The first element of this statement is color, so-called color kinematics duality. It says that if you look at gauge boson scattering or gluon scattering, <clears throat> there is actually uh, uh, an isomorphism, so to speak, between color and kinematics, such that the kinematic structures satisfy the same identities as the color structures. And we'll, I'll show you that explicitly. And this is a duality. They, they come in uh, kind of parallel, parallel structures. The statement of the double copy is, is the statement that we want to take that isomorphism seriously, take color and replace it with kinematics, or vice versa. That's fine, too. And what you get is not just some random function, you actually get an actual amplitude in a new theory, which in, in, in the case I talked about yesterday was gravity. Okay. So uh, this again is uh, me reviewing the statement of three particle scattering on shell and 4D, written in terms of spin and helicity variables. This is really just to show you compact formulas, but the statements are more general than 4D. Okay. Uh, this was asked to me at some point, which is how general is the statement? It's a general dimensional statement. Uh, uh, which is which makes it particularly nice, but in 40 it's very easy to see here. The statement is that if you take the gluon amplitude, which has the structure constant, and you just throw it FABC and replace it with another copy of this, then you get the graviton amplitude. That's what we talked about yesterday. Now uh, let's move on to four point where things are more interesting. And I was admittedly a little fast even yesterday, but I want to unpack this a bit more. So let's consider four particle scattering for gluons. Okay, gluon scattering, just Yang Mills theory. Okay. Uh, of course, if you compete with Feynman diagrams, you have uh, cubic diagrams, which naturally come with poles and ST and U. You have a quartic diagram, which naively seems missing in this, in this formula, right? There's a quartic vertex. But, <coughs> excuse me. but of course, any uh, uh, quartic vertex can be reabsorbed either into NS, NT, or NU. Okay? I can think of a quartic vertex as some local function of momenta. I can multiply by S and divide by S and absorb it into one of the new members. Okay. Now, that is certainly a choice, but as it turns out in four point, make whatever choice you want, and write it in this form. And what you find is the following. While the color structures obey the usual uh, uh, mathematical identity of Jacobi, <clears throat> the numerators also satisfy that identity on shell. Okay. It's crucial that we include on shell conditions and momentum conservation for that fact to be true when you, when you are checking the state. Okay, so uh, uh, this, is, this is four point where it's extremely, exceedingly uh, simple. Okay. Once you decided that uh, color and kinematics are interchangeable, we can now do what BC and J did, which is plainly replace them. Okay. So there's actually two options. Could you yeah. please give an example because we understand the color. I understand the color right. in the C's, but could you please write an example for N, any N you like? Right. So N S and T or good. so for N. Uh, is there a well, actually, the, the best example I could probably give is three point. But uh, the idea here is that so NS would be whatever you compute in the numerator for a Feynman diagram of this type. So let's say you have this. Like that one. Okay. Oh, okay. So put the other one in the garbage. Okay. Could you please write an expression? So this is one on S from this poll. Okay. The rest of the numerators you'll compute from actual Feynman diagrams. So this would include any, this is some function which is multilinear in epsilon one, epsilon two. Epsilon three and epsilon four, okay. Mu one, mu two, mu three, mu four. Okay, literally what you compute from Feynman diagrams times some numerator function, mu one, mu two, mu three, mu four, which depends on the momenta p one, p two, p three, four. Okay. Okay. Now this function here will be order p squared. Okay. It depends on what gauge you work on. So if you, I, it, it, it really matters which gauge you pick. This is not a gauge invariant statement. What this uh, particular term is. So this statement here is, this is NS. Okay. All right, so like literally the Feynman rules, the Feynman vertex for this and the Feynman vertex for that, just contract it. It's some function which is multilinear in the external polarizations the and has two moments. For epsilon types. Uh, A tensor, P that's right. P1 and, or some two Ps. Exactly, that's right. And how, how do the you convolute? The There's many different terms here. So if you actually did with those Feynman rules, You'd have contractions of e1 dot e2, e1 dot p2. Okay. It's that big mess you get from Feynman. So roughly speaking, you'll get an expression that looks like e, e e dot p, let's say squared e dot e. 
Yeah. Terms like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Yes. If anything needs more explicit uh, unpacking, just tell me. But really, I just mean here what you'd compute using Feynman rules using this language. Thank you. Also, yeah. Simple question: Is there a reason you use A for gluon amplitude, but then M for? Right? Just that this is the uh, common usage in okay, but the field. It's the same. Yeah, yeah, there's, but they're both amplitudes. Yeah, A and M are both amplitudes. It's just that we're so used to shuffling between them that we want to be able to label them separately. But yes, they're both amplitudes. These are both amplitudes. Yeah. So you can see what's going to happen here is that when I take CS and replace it with NS, I'll get the squared version of this. Okay, like quite literally this squared. Okay, uh, 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 I, I've shown maybe here a little more explicitly here, which is that. While NS, NT, and NU will depend on polarizations multilinearly, E1, E2, E3, E4, when I square them, they'll now depend on two polarizations. Okay. Right. If I took this expression like this, okay, it'll contain pieces that have E1, mu1, E1, mu, uh, uh, nu1. Okay. Bilinears in E1, also in E2, also in E3, also in E4, because I squared it. The idea is that this object, you can think, is a bi vector. Which is the graviton polarization. Okay. So, this is the way that you build the plus and cross gravitational wave polarization from the plus uh, and minus helicity configurations of the field. So, you have uh, two apps so for one uh, graviton, four graviton, you have four apps. So eight. Four, eight. Eight total. That's correct. You have the square just that. Yes, that's right. There's one. Two, three, four, exactly. So that's exactly the four polarizations of the graviton, which is why you have something that could even make sense to be a graviton. You'll also notice that in the squaring procedure, the number of p's has increased. That is exactly accommodated to the fact that gravity has more derivatives. It's a, de a softer theory than gauge theory. So can you see this in the one drawing? Well, that, that's just like whole talk. Yeah. Uh, so no, you cannot. You cannot. But you should be able to compute it, right? <clears throat> you can still compute it. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, so here's what you can do. You can, of course, compute the graviton amplitude and realize that it can be repackaged in this form. Yes. Okay, like redefine the, the, the gravitational field in terms of the vector field squared. So, okay. Well, that's so that's kind of exactly the question. Okay. So I'm showing you a fact about amplitudes. A great a corollary question is can you make this manifest at the level of Feynman diagrams? That's the purpose of this talk. Yeah. Yes. So just uh, wait a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so as I said in my talk, this has been this is a proven fact at tree level because we give on shell recursion. We can literally check that this operation is preserved when we look at n point down to n minus one point. So we can recursively prove that it's true, it's been recycled, and there's all other applications. Okay. Now it's also something that goes beyond gauge theory and gravity. Okay. I hopefully emphasize this well in my talk. This is uh, it's like weirdly ubiquitous amongst nice theories. This is a big old table in this review by Zvi Byrne and friends from three years ago, two, uh, three years ago, which just has like theories and their products with other theories. Okay, so there's a lot of things here that aren't just gravity and gauge theory. Uh, for instance, the nonlinear sigma model, born in felt theory, some conformal gravities, uh, multiplets, fundamental matter, all kinds of stuff. Okay, I'll leave this to you if you care to see what's here. It's mostly Susie, right? Uh, there's a lot of Susie ones, but you can remove the Susies in oh, these cases. The yeah, oh, like they kind of work their way all the way up. There's also uh, Volkov Alkalov. Uh, there's all this kind of whole multiplication rule of things, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, which which I can tell you about. Uh, yeah. So like the question. simplest case of Yang melted matter. Yeah. What's the analog of like something that forces gauge theory? Good. The right. So uh, it's a common question. So uh, you have to think about what this operation means, which is you could say like, does this work for any gauge group? What 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 is needed of CS and CT and CU? Now the thing to keep in mind is the only thing I needed was a Jacobi identity satisfied, which is true for any gauge theory. Okay. And you have to keep in mind that I take CSCT and CU and I throw them away, right? This doesn't depend on gauge group because I'm taking the a structure of a gauge theory for any gauge group, removing the color and replacing it with kinematics. So it's not really a, 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 the question isn't what gauge group is this true for? The, the statement is really that you can think of gravity in this case as a gauge theory for which the color structures have been replaced in a certain way. So if you like, start with SO3, start with SU2, SU2 cross SU3 cross, SU, uh, cross U1, start with SU5, it doesn't matter. I'm going to throw that color structure away anyway and replace with kinematics. So the question isn't which gauge theory is this true for, the really the question is why, why, why am I substituting these generic color structures for these specific types of kinematic functions? And, and the NS yeah. doesn't depend on the gauge group? No, no. 
Yeah. Right. As you know this from Feynman rules, right? From Feynman rules, there's FABC and the vertex, and then there's kinematics. So those are independent, thankfully, which is why it's internal. If it wasn't internal, then it would that would be uh, a problem, but it is. Okay. Um, so yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Can you double gang mills with matter to get? Einstein gravity with matter, but that doesn't even matter. Like you double the amount of matter. Good. So let me give an example. So let's say you take uh, 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 Yang Mills, the Yang Mills coupled to like an uh, adjoint fermion, also known as a, a Guino. Uh, if you start double copying, if you take a glue, uh, if you take a, a, a gluon and a Guino and double copy them, you get a gravitino. So you kind of get the net, all the other natural objects you get if you added their spins and uh, 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 their little group weight. What if you put yeah. in the fundamental? So in the fundamental, it's more complicated. That was studied uh, in one of these papers. So that's literally QCD. I think it's been done with massless and massive. Uh, it maps, I think, to some kind of vector. So like a, a, a fermionic uh, fundamental vector coupled to uh, gang mills will give you some kind of vector coupled to gravity, some kind of complicated story. But it's a, there's like an infinite regress of different products you can take. But I, I would refer you to this uh, figure if you're, if you're curious. It's also been done with masses. Yes, it's been done with mass. There's also color kinematics value for masses. Yes, there's, there's, they've been done for masses. Well, the easiest way to know that I'm, I'm telling you the truth is that we apply these to, of course, black holes and ultimately black holes in uh, Einstein's general relativity, which of course have mass. So uh, it, it's, it's uh, 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 very easy to add masses uh, to the setup. I can tell you why. Okay, here's a, a really simple way of understanding it. These are state statements that are true in general dimension. So I can start in one higher dimension and then Kaluza Klein uh, compactify, and then I'll get a massive states. And then I can imagine doing double copy for the massive states. So roughly speaking, that's the way that you can inherit a double copy for massive particles. Of course, you have a tower, which you'd have to worry about if you uh, are inclusively summing over all modes, but you know, you, you know what you're kind of doing. Okay. So but is there is a context where masses are included. Was so that an easy way of getting a helicity method with massive particles? Uh, because that was right. That's, that's a mess. Yeah, well, it's become less of a mess recently. Uh, so there used to be, there's just of course been the kind of reference dependent choices uh, for doing massive spinner helicity, but with this, uh, 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 I think this more recent work by Yutin Wang and Yima, where they build all amp, uh, uh, scattering amplitudes for all masses and spins, it's pretty elegant. So I would say at this point, it's pretty simple. Okay. Um, but I haven't thought about whether you could use this to actually build a kinematic formalism. That would be, certainly be interesting. It should, I mean, yeah. it should work. It sounds it's like possible, yeah, it's possible. I haven't tried personally. Anyway, what I wanted to get at in this talk, uh, well, last, last talk, but also this, is that uh, uh, there's a, a re relatively generic kind of feature in a lot of theories. Hopefully that table conveyed that, including the case of pions, which is really gonna be mostly uh, the talk, uh, uh, I'm gonna focus uh, the topic of this talk today. So by pions here, I mean, uh, really in the chiral limit. So uh, the, the scalars in the nonlinear sigma model, okay. And uh, I'm kind of writing this down to just kind of right at the get-go, address like what are natural questions or suggestions as to what might the double copy be? Copy be? So of course, uh, uh, the first thing I remember thinking when I heard about the double copy is like, well, you certainly just sit, rediscover the tetrad formula, okay? Right. It's, it's long been understood that you can think of gravity as a gauge theory where the spin connection is of essence become a one. There's an infinite number of variations of this idea would include tetradic Palatini formalism or McDowell Montori or Plavansky, Carol Plavansky, there's like any number of variations, all built on this idea that you have a literally a gauge boson whose gauge group is SOC couple. Now, uh, this is not it. You can just check it. Okay? So the statement is if you just took all the colors and replaced them with the Lorentz group, this is just not the operation we're talking about. Okay? So that's just not it. I wish it was it. Maybe it's more subtly related to it, but it's evidently not the operation we're doing. Uh, is it open string, closed string duality? So this is uh, something that, that Tony asked um, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, which was, well, there's something called open string, uh, uh, closed string duality, so-called KLT, which is a version of this uh, a double copy that was discovered in string theory. Okay. And the idea is that you can write relations between open string and closed string amplitudes and the alpha prime goes to zero limit. Those become statements of graviton and, and, uh, and gluon amplitudes. And it's, it's certainly connected at low energies, but it's, I should say one thing is it's not technically this operation, okay? The so-called KLT relations do not operate at the level of numerators and there's no Jacobi identities. All that stuff was understood by B, C, and J. KLT is simply an operation on full on amplitudes, like literally taking full amplitudes and multiplying them in certain ways and adding them. So it's structurally different, 
But uh, really my retreat here is that uh, uh, I don't believe that you should have to embed something in string theory to explain it. If it's true about like more generic QFTs, uh, uh, I think this QFT fact deserves a QFT explanation. Also the string theory explanation is not one obviously that happens at the level of a Lagrangian or at the level, I mean, there's, like, there's no like Lagrangian for this, at least not one, one that's not on the world sheet. It's the understanding comes from a very complicated fact about world sheet uh, uh, vertex operators. Okay, so it's, it's, it's kind of murky how to really make this into a concrete statement. Uh, the, I think the grandest uh, aspiration you might have is to actually give like a literal symmetry argument. Like uh, here's a Lagrangian that's equivalent to your original Lagrangian that has this as a symmetry. Okay, now, as I said, uh, double copy is a proven fact about on-shell amplitudes, okay? You could ask people in amplitudes, why is it true? And they'll show you 10 different proofs mathematically for why it holds for on-shell flat space tree level amplitudes. Okay. Now, despite that, I will I, I want to convince you today that no one has any idea why it's true. Because if you try deforming any of those proofs outside of flat space, outside of tree level, or outside of on-shell, no one has an idea what's happening. Okay, we're kind of proving identities that hinge crucially on the on-shellness, the flat space, and the tree level, which I would say means that we could benefit from a deeper understanding. In particular, we don't even know when it's true. Okay, so next time someone says they've understood it perfectly, you can just ask them, uh, does your proof work in curved space time? Okay, I think 99.99% of proofs will fail because you don't have Mandelstam invariance, you have no notion of kinematics, okay? You don't even know what you're computing. So it's not amplitudes, you have correlation functions. Uh, you could even ask which theories. I showed you a whole table of theories. Are there more theories? What if I had higher dimension operators? Which higher dimension operators are okay? There's definitely been work studying this, but no one has an answer, which is like, okay, this is it. Okay. Higher loops is something I didn't mention yet, but um, let me just kind of say it in words. Um, this whole construction uh, works at higher loop has been used even by us in the, in the case of uh, studying gravity uh, and in the black hole in spiral problem. The idea is that if you take an integrand, oh, sorry. This, did this one run out too? Yeah, jeez. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, if you imagine that this is embedded inside some big loop diagram, some big loop integrand, okay? The statement of color kinematics at loops is simply the statement that that Jacobi identity is satisfied for any sub four point uh, diagram inside an integrand, okay? So the statement of at least the way, we, the way it's implemented in all these calculations is you, you construct an integrand before integration, and then you look and check that the numerator satisfies the Jacobi identities, okay? Then you integrate it afterward, okay? Now you might say, why is that the rule? Well, I don't, we don't know. Is, can you integrate that first and then double copy? No one knows because we have we just don't understand how it works. So higher loops is something we can kind of practically use, and we know it works, but we don't actually know uh, I think why it works. Is it true non-perturbatively? And I can say this in in kind of two senses. One is uh, is it true uh, 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 for for quantum mechanical terms, non-analytic in the coupling? But I can even ask this kind of in the in the kind of classical theory. Uh, and in, in this sense, I mean non-perturbative in the sense of numerical relativity. So numerical relativity is, of course, a purely classical setup, but it's strong field. G Newton is finite. It's a non-perturbative classical dynamics uh, that connects to this. In what context is any of this true? Okay. No, I think <clears throat> non-perturbatively, it's a rather nonsensical question because all your derivations depend on unshellness. Non right, right. Clones cannot be on shell. Right, right. I think and they just right. disappear. They Absolutely. Can... So if you ask me what I think is going to happen here for non perturbative quantum mechanically, it'd be very surprising for there to be a remnant because even the very definition of asymptotic space has changed. But non perturbatively, in the sense of a classical equation of motion, I will show you an example of how that works. But I, I agree. Yeah. So, so that's why my own personal uh, belief is that, and all the evidence I think we have, is that double copy is most likely a classical tree-level effect. We can fold it into perturbative loop calculations because of unitarity when we have uh, asymptotic states that are well-defined in the perturbative limit, uh, which will still give us power. Okay. But I will say that we don't know. Okay, So uh, I am with you in thinking that I think quantum non-perturbative fractions would be very surprising to include. But I think a lot is at stake just to evaluate the question. Okay. In other words, we don't understand in which cases double copy holds. And I think the stakes are high for the following reason. Okay? As soon as I tell you that gravity on shell scattering amplitudes are related to a non-gravitational series amplitudes, you can just start asking interesting questions. If you believe that it's true in curve space or for classical solutions, 
that you extrapolate all the way to non-perturbables, then this would give a full-on re recasting of, if you like, quantum gravity from lattice DC. Now, as I said, that seems too strong to me, and as I've told many people here. But a much more reasonable claim, which I think is probably true, is that this is all true classically, tree level, classical, in which case lattice, uh, uh, a lattice QCD in the classical regime would, would, would square to numerical relativity, which I still think would be a very powerful tool just for understanding. Yeah. But I, I agree with, with uh, what you say. Could yeah. I'll give a quick comment about yeah. at least unshell for multi point, it's a special kinematic configuration, right? So you're saying uh, probably for this special kinematic configuration, I, I have to double copy hold, which means what do I do next, right? I, I, I cal calculate a special configuration, then, then I do some continuation. So I would say that physical kinematics, even at higher point, is not special. It's the only physical thing you can measure. So if you took a five particle amplitude and looked at stuff that was not present when that vanished when you go on shell, we know that we can, through a field redefinition, throw that up to higher point. So I would say invariantly, and this is even how we do, I think, matching in many cases, uh, 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 the stuff on shell contains all the information you need. That off-shell stuff, which we include in matching, can always be tossed upstream to a higher point amplitude. So it is physical, but at the, at the amplitude order you care about, you don't have to care about, you don't have to worry about it. It also has yeah. to, probably has to do with the fact that the word identity where you replace P of a gluon by its polarization epsilon, when you go to the non abelian theory, it only holds when all of the other gluons are on shell. So it's probably the case that in some way to prove this, this squaring property, you'll need to appeal to a worded entity that only holds on shell. Uh, good, that's a very natural inclination to think that it should almost be impossible to have an off shell version of this because on shell was so crucial. Yes. Yes, I'll show you an example where that's actually not needed. But, uh, but, 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 but I will say the reason is because gauge invariance. Yeah. I bet it doesn't have a gauge invariance. Yes, exactly. So you can anticipate that. So the examples I'm going to study in this case are going to be for pions yeah. where I can do this. But I absolutely agree. The case of gauge theory is precisely subtle because of this non, this much more, if you like, non local in diagram space constraint of, of the on shellness of the other. In QED, ways. you would not have that. For speed. sure. But in yeah, QCD, right. QCD, the gluons have this. The gluons have, all of the course. Gluons have absolutely. Yeah. That is that is the heart of what's hard for the gauge case. For the for the chiral uh, for the chiral Lagrangian case, we'll see that something kind of simpler happens. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. In fact, here's here's the upshot, the technical statement that I want to say in my talk, and then I'll unpack it in many more equations. Okay. There is actually a field theory origin and understanding uh, that we we now have uh, as of uh, this year or so for the pion double copy and its cousins. Okay. So I showed you this case of pion times pion equals another theory. Okay. Here, here's what it is, okay? Uh, I'm using, I'm gonna use the word color, which is an unfortunate nomenclature. I'm talking about pions, so I, I'm saying color, but I mean flavor, and I'm just saying this because in, in all amplitude circles, we just get tired of having to say color and flavor in context. So the statement of, of color, despite of course the fact that it's a gauge symmetry and not a flavor symmetry, uh, really just referring to kind of the, the label A in all these fields, uh, this will actually be flavor, uh, uh, and I'll use flavor and color interchangeably when I talk about pions. So the pions, of course, have no actual color. The statement of the double copy is this very crisp uh, mapping. Take the color algebra, okay? As I said, color kinematics sends color to something, which depends on kinematics. The replacement is to send color to the diffeomorphism algebra, which really all I mean here is the algebra brackets, okay? The algebra vectors, okay? I'm calling it a diffeomorphism, not because it's connected to gravity, but just because it is a translation, which is field dependent, because V mu is a field. So V mu of X, D mu, okay? It's diff algebra, it's Lie algebra brackets, okay? Now, the reason why this is an allowed move is that, you know, if you think about what makes your ward identity consistent and what have you, it's Jacobi, but Jacobi will still be satisfied if I replace color with diff, okay? So it sounds mechanically, every operation you use to prove any fact about your gauge theory uh, 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 will still hold if you apply this replacement. And I'm now gonna show you how we can do this explicitly at the level of uh, first equations of motion. Uh, I'll actually talk about curve space. Uh, I didn't mention it here. I'll, I'll then talk about a low dimensional example in 2D, <clears throat> uh, uh, higher loops, classical solutions, and even some connections to integrability for the low dimensional case. Okay, so here's the outline. I'm gonna show you how the double copy for pions arises from first principles, not from just amplitudes abracadabra, but from actually deriving them from the equations of motion. I'll then, you know, now that you know what you're doing, I, don't, I can just let go of amplitudes. I can like, I don't care about on shell, forget flat space. I can now 
fly and do other things like go to curve space. And I'll show you how we uh, generalize this to uh, actually any symmetric uh, curve space time, which includes as a subset maximally symmetric spaces like ADS and DS. Uh, and I'll also tell you what the objects that double copy are. They are of course not amplitudes, which don't exist in curve space. And then I'll talk about double copy at all perturbative orders, so all loop orders, and also uh, uh, a version which is non-perturbative in the sense of classical solution dimension. Okay, so let's start from equations of motion. Okay, so this is a textbook, a Lagrangian for the NLSM. This J here is the chiral current. It will uh, play a crucial role throughout this talk. The way we often think about it here, I've set the pi and decay constant to one to simplify things. If you uh, embed with the kind of usual exponential map, e to the i pi over f into your uh, group element, this is the chiral current. <clears throat> And the equation of motion says that the chiral current is conserved modulo whatever sources exist for the pion. This is a standard story. Okay. Now there's one twist, of course, that uh, many of you are familiar with, and I even touched on in my talk, which is that there is uh, a, a redundancy or an ambiguity, which is a choice of coordinates. So you can, of course, have an exponential map here, but you can also have a Cayley map. There's an infinite set of mappings of the pion degree of freedom inside G. Okay. No one is right, so they're just all different choices. These are the field we, oops, these are the field we definitions that I mentioned uh, yesterday. Okay. Now, so the same is not like one's good, one's bad. You can do use any one you want, use any choice, and you, when you compute some on-shell physical quantity, it will be, uh, it will be uh, uh, one lot change your answer. So your edge group is arbitrary. Oh, not edge. Uh, Sorry. Flavor group is arbitrary, right? Uh, right now it is, but in the next slide it will not be arbitrary. Or at present, it is. Yeah. Uh, that will surely change and be crucial, actually. Yeah. And you're also in 4D, right? No, no, this is in general. general. This is general D. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm not going to actually use spinner helicity at all for the rest of this talk. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, as I said, you know, let's say you want to just find a double copy form. Okay. Here's what you could do. Oh, I'm just going to keep trying to choose embeddings of pi and g until I get. You know, maybe a cubic action, like maybe something, you know, somehow these diagrams fall out. Okay, really bad way of doing it. Okay, and you know why? There's this intrinsic redundancy just at step zero. Like your Lagrange depends on pi, and pi can be mapped to a different pi, and that's the problem. Okay, now uh, let's do something slightly different. Okay, and there's actually an interesting historical corollary to this that I learned very recently. Uh, let's define a first order formulation of the NLSM. Okay, and here's where I'm gonna have to choose a gauge group, actually, or not, not choose a gauge group. But choose a certain class of gauge groups that are very large. Our gauge. Yeah. I, you said gauge, but let me call it a flavor group. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I will say color and gauge. But let's say let's call it whatever flavor group, color group. Uh, but whatever this internal symmetry is, uh, consider the following. Imagine I took you know forget pi. The idea is let's banish pi from our minds for the moment. Let's just think about the chiral current itself. Think of it as a vector field, okay, which has a field strength for which I can define a structure constant f a b c. Now, this implies that J is pure gauge, which is precisely uh, uh, this condition here. Okay. And, and, and what this means is that if you just implicitly define the field strength of vanish, G is born, because in other words, the, the parts of J that are not G have been projected out effectively. And if you like, there's some scalar mode living inside J mu through this constraint. Okay. Now you could say, well, how is pi embedded in G? I don't care. I've, I define this implicitly, so I don't care how you embed pi. I'm really just going to deal with the J. Okay? It's much more invariant because the chiral current is the thing which is much more invariant. This is the second equation I'll use, which is just the equation of motion, which I'll just take as, again as input. So these are my two equations to input. The first thing, if you like, defines the pion in an abstract implicit way. And the second equation is the chiral current conservation. You can combine these <clears throat> and you get this equation, which is, if you like, a dynamical equation of motion for the chiral current itself. Okay. Box J equals JJ D mu J. So uh, here we have, uh, because of the way I arrange derivatives, a Feynman propagator. So I think of this equation of motion as encoding some kind of Behrens Gila recursion relation for amplitudes. You can think of this as the propagator. There's a Feynman rule associated with this. This is a cubic interaction because it's got two J's, but it's an equation of motion. So this is really a three point function. And the source is now D mu J. Okay. Now there's a, there's a, a uh, there's actually more than one uh, historical background for this, which is uh, uh, there's this uh, Friedman Townsend paper, which didn't do this, but built actually a two form dual theory uh, to the chiral Lagrangian using this const constraint. So they did kind of the non, non abelian generalization of dualizing a two form to an axion, but instead it's a, a two form to a pion. Okay? Uh, so that's an old story. 
Uh, what's uh, amusing is I gave a talk, uh, basically this talk uh, three weeks ago at the, uh, the Bohr Centennial, the 100th anniversary of the uh, Niels Bohr Institute. And it was great because Sasha Polykov pointed out that this has been written before, <laughs> uh, I think before the Iron Curtain fell, by Fedeyev in some uh, uh, paper on uh, 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 invariant perturbation theory for, uh, 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 for pions, essentially. So uh, what, this is there. Or what invariant perturbation? For invariant perturbation theory for, I think, chiral, chiral Lagrangian. Okay. Yeah, like it's, a, it's a phenomenally beautiful paper where he already understood all these things that, well, we kind of understood independently, but just the fact that there's something you win from modding out by the redundancy I was talking about. So that invariant is about the, the coordinate plane redundancy. So I should cite that here, but that was relevant. Okay, so the statement is the following. You can, you can already see that, um, uh, okay, I have a cubic theory now, okay? Cubic theory, Feynman propagator. So if you drew the Feynman rules, it would have simple Feynman cubic diagrams and they'd have vertices that look really weird, but are, are, are such as they are. And the sources look like D mu of a source. So they would look like P mu's as like external polarization. Okay. So, of course, the pion is still a scalar. This vector is some auxiliary thing, but it encodes all the pion. Okay. Now, of course, you, you should wor rightly worry, wait a minute, I don't care about chiral current scattering. I care about pion scattering, right? I don't want to scatter j's. I want to scatter pi's. But j and pi are related up to linear, at linear order, okay, in this way. Okay. You might worry about these dot, dot, dots, because they go with pi squared, pi cubed, and so on. And these dot, dot, dots depend on your field basis. They're crucial, right? These are the exact things that are troubling us. Uh, uh, but here's the, the, the wonderful magic of Onshell. As you know, if you have uh, uh, two fields which are related at linear level up to nonlinear corrections, then if you compute Onshell amplitudes uh, 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 for them, they will be equivalent because LSC projects out the nonlinear. Okay? So I can actually cross out the dot dot. Okay? Uh, furthermore, if I want to extract literally the pion, I just invert this equation. So I dot uh, this guy into Q. Okay? You might say, what's Q? Q is any reference you want. Okay. Q is any arbitrary d-dimensional vector. It doesn't matter, okay, as long as it's perpendicular to the momentum. It's just a generic momentum. If you like, it's like an axial gauge direction, okay. Uh, and and you formally invert this. So the idea is that this is like Q dot P, where uh, J has been Fourier transformed. Okay. The, the the final point, however, is is actually really simple, which is that if you compute the one point function for the pion, it's the same as the one point function for the chiral current, but with this weird polarization which is Q over PQ, that's just this, okay? So in other words, from the one point functions of chiral currents, you can get one point functions of pions. And from one point functions of pions in the presence of the source, we can of course differentiate with respect to source. This thing is, is of course related to the uh, generating functional for all, all connected Green's functions, and we can generate all amplitudes. This is only on shell, right? This is only on shell, exactly. So this is a relationship on shell when uh, P1 and all the way to PN are on shell. So the statement is the following. To compute a pion amplitude, don't. Compute instead amplitudes for this J theory, where, uh, 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 where basically you're solving this equation of motion iteratively. Okay. Now, that equation of motion iteratively is just Feynman rules. You can write down the Feynman rules for what I just described. Okay. What are the J equations of motion that perturbatively solve that equation? There's the Feynman propagator, as I said. There's a vertex. Okay. It's got one derivative, one P derivative. That comes from the fact that there's one derivative here. Okay. Uh, the external polarization is P mu, okay? So it looks like a longitudinal gauge boson polarization. That comes because uh, there's a derivative here. Okay. And um, last but not least, one of the legs has this weird polarization, okay? Because the statement is that we're competing the one-point function for J. Okay, so these are just the Feynman rules, okay? Uh, if you like, just take this three-point function, string it together in, the, in every possible way with a Feynman propagator, and then put these in as your external polarizations. Okay, now here's the magic. All right, so compute this 100% off shell. Okay, just take this three particle vertex and put it into this diagram, compute this numerator off shell. Okay, so I'm not assuming P squared equals zero. P1, P2, P3, P4, totally arbitrary. All I assumed is momentum conservation, which still holds off shell. Okay. Uh, but uh, this is, this, these three diagrams, when you add them, they exactly equal zero as an identity, okay? So what is the statement? The statement is that these Feynman diagram rules manifestly exhibit color kinematics duality off shell, okay? Sum to zero, but why? Okay, why did that happen? Why the miracle? Well, the miracle is that if you just study the equation I wrote, 
you realize it looks like a lot like a much simpler theory. Okay. This theory is called bi-adjoint scalar theory. Yeah, it's kind of a weird, complicated name, but it, that's what it sounds like. It's a scalar field that has two colors and it's an adjoint under both colors, okay? So this A index is an adjoint of one color, A bar is an adjoint of another color, okay? So we're thinking of a, a simple theory with two color groups under which it is an adjoint under both. And this is just a cubic interaction. Yeah. You can probably anticipate this is the kind of essential like underlying structure behind everything. Because you know, when I say that kinematics has a Jacobi identity, I could always call the kinematics this barred structure constant, right? Kind of schematically. Okay. But now I want you to just really compare these. Okay. If you imagine that the A, Bs, and Cs without bars are just spectators, then you can see a mapping between barred indices and Lorentz indices. Okay. So there's some mapping here. What is the mapping? Okay. This is the mapping. Okay. So um, here is the claim. Uh, well, which we could prove, and I'll show you a bunch of examples of equations. Literally take a theory with adjoints of color or flavor or whatever you have and apply this mapping. You have VA, I apply this mapping, which sends the adjoint index to mu, that's a rule, to a, a Lorentz subscript. Take any structure constant and replace it with the uh, structure constant for the diff algebra. So this is just the uh, uh, Lie bracket. <clears throat> okay. Take any external source and replace it with D mu j. That's the rules, okay? just by inspection. And again, I call this a structure constant for diffs because if you just take a commutator of two of these diffeomorphisms, that's what you get. Okay, right. So like, partial mu is the generator, right? So this this thing sitting in front of this new generator is just uh, the Lie re bracket. Okay. So this replacement uh, directly gives. Uh, so if you apply this replacement to this equation, you get this equation. Okay. So I'm just by I determining what the mapping is. And as you can see, it's a mapping of color to the diff algebra. Okay. Color of flavor. <laughs> yes, flavor, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, what can we do here? This is still flavor current, uh, but uh, uh, well, that's, that's the issue is like, uh, well, I'm just gonna keep calling color anyway. But uh, the, 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 the point here is that we can apply this now to anything with an index, okay? So it used to be that I'm just manipulating functions and P's and E's. You know, where is this coming from? The rule is you have an adjoint index, do what I said. Okay, so here is a co conserved current in the scalar theory. Okay, this thing obviously has two, two separate uh, uh, global symmetries here associated with the barred and unbarred indices. Okay, you can just write down the conserved current. Here's what it is. Okay, it's usual nether current. Okay, so this is conserved in the original theory, in the, in the scalar by adjoint scalar theory. Just apply your mapping. So, what does that mean? It means take leave your A's the same. So A is the same, it's just a spectator. Take your barred indices, turn them into Lorentz indices and replace the structure constant with the diff algebra. Okay, so you get this uh, conserved current, claimed conjectured conserved current of the nonlinear sigma model. So it's a bilinear conserved current in the NLSM. Okay. Now, when we first encountered this, I was like, this can't be right. Like what conserved current is this? This is like crazy. Like there's another one, what, what is this? Okay. Uh, it's, 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 this is, I should also say this is independent of your basis. You know, I don't care what basis you're in, everyone agrees what the chiral current is. This bilinear is conserved. Okay. Uh, uh, technical note, I don't know if there's any absolute experts here, but actually fundamental BCJ is literally the word, is literally the conservation equation of this, of this current. We call this the kinematic current for the reason that it is literally the conserved current which corresponds to the kinematic Jacobi identity. Right? So just like the color current corresponds to the color Jacobi identity, the kinematic current corresponds to the kinematic current. So this is the exact analog. Excuse me, as yeah. far as I read, it has two indices, right? Both yeah. spatial. Yes. And there is uh, this famous theory which says, apart from the empty momentum tensor, there can be no other conserved quantities with two spatial. Absolutely. Which is why it is a stress symmetry. So uh -huh. of course, coleman mandula forbids the kinematic symmetries. In fact, the, the first thing you could ask very reasonably, as you've asked, is how can there be a kinematic algebra because there can't be kinematic symmetry because we know that they're exhausted by things like uh, 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 unless you extend to a graded Lie algebra and so on, that whole story. The point is there is not a kinematic symmetry. There is only a kinematic current and it's a descendant of the stress center. So there's nothing new. This two object object, uh, two index object up to improvement terms that are trivially conserved is, uh, is, is merely the stress center, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And of course there's no conserved charges associated with it because it's not a new physical quantity. Okay? Uh, if you like, if you, if you try computing the conserved uh, uh, charges, you'll get that they're all vanishing. 
essentially because it's differences of energies and differences of volumes. So the upshot is there is not a kinematic symmetry. There is only a conserved kinematic current and it's related to the stress tensor. If you like, it's kind of the most conservative explanation you could imagine. I have not added anything new. I've just introduced an implication that is already implied by the by energy conservation and momentum conservation. Okay, does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So now let's. let's Sometimes uh, it yeah. happens. For instance, the uh, scale current, dilatation current, is related to the energy momentum tensor and its trace. So in right. principle, if you extract the, uh, this problem, use the properties of this of energy momentum tensor, you don't need to introduce the scale current. It's right, right. It's, a, it's embedded in its trace. Yeah, right, it's right. a secondary object. Right, right, for sure. I think it's exactly like this, yeah. There's nothing new. <laughs> it's still there. It was there the whole time. Now, what I can do is now let's apply this to everything I, I see. So as I said, take an adjoint index of color, replace it with diff. I'm going to do it everywhere. Uh, this, is, I, this I already did. I'm just going to do this in parallel. Start with the bi adjoint scalar equation of motion and then do the operation. A bar goes to U and I just rename phi J and that's what I just described. Right, let's do something more complicated. Let's start with pions. Okay, let's start with NLSM. Uh, pions on the chiral limit, let's start with NLSM. Uh, as I said, this is a way of defining the theory. Um, let me take these equations and just do it a second time. Okay? By second time, I mean there's A, F, A, F, A, B, C. Let me replace all the A, B's, and C's with Lorentz indices and add another diff algebra uh, a generator. You get this totally insane equation with, with a two index object, okay? a, a tensor, D by D matrix, a D by D matrix uh, degree of freedom complicated uh, set of equations of motion. Uh, because I know what the scattering amplitudes are, I know that it's gonna be amplitudes in these so-called uh, Galilean theories, or special Galilean theories, which are uh, essentially related to, uh, exactly related to longitudinal modes of uh, massive gravity. That's its like historical uh, uh, origins, also from a, a, a so-called DGP, this like five dimensional uh, uh, construction that was conceived of the energy problem. So it has a, has a long uh, kind of back history, but the point is it's a very interesting uh, scalar field theory, just like pions. And this is exactly just a new formulation of it. Okay? So you can just check, we did this like six particle scattering and just verify that it's right. Okay? If you like, this is just a new form that we've derived. Here's something even uh, more fun, okay? Something a little more familiar. Here's something with a color index, gang mills itself. Okay, so let's see gang mills theory, which has, of course, the field strength and the field equation. There's an A, B, and C. What would happen if you took yang mills, took the color, and replaced it with diff? Okay, very natural thing to do. Um, well, you get these equations. Uh, you get a three index field strength, a two index gauge field. It's very peculiar. I'm not saying it looks normal, but it's a set of coupled equations. And you find that it exactly reproduces the amplitudes in born in field theory, okay, which is exactly what was prescribed by the double copy. This is really just a check. But this is a first order formulation of born in field theory, which unlike other formulations or most formulations, truncates a number of vertices, right? So uh, famously born in field theory is, uh, you know, uh, okay, whatever. Born in field has, has an interesting structure, which is, it looks like the square root of flat metric plus F mu nu, okay? So it's got like an infinite series of F to the N, F to the two N corrections. But this kind of repackages all that in some kind of interesting auxiliary way. So this is an alternative form of Bornenfeld theory that I, I've not encountered before, actually. Um, maybe, maybe others know if it has been. Okay, so uh, what's the upshot here? Uh, I think for pions, we understand what's happening. Really, maybe the most basic statement I'd say is that the chiral Lagrangian is secretly cubic phi cube theory with a weird color group, which is the diff algebra. Okay. And one, one thing I'll also mention, which was actually an inspiration in doing this, is if you squint at this, you realize this looks a lot like the Navier-Stokes equation, which is how we arrived at this. This, this looks like the nonlinear piece of the uh, Navier-Stokes equation. And if I replace, replace the, uh, uh, the Lambertian here with the heat equation, the heat uh, uh, differential operator, this would be, literally be the Navier-Stokes equation, which is why I was talking about that yesterday. Okay, um, so all this is uh, uh, a still flat space. Okay? But at least it's me giving you a flat space equation of motion field level description of why the double copy is arising. But once I have it, I can now try to go farther. Okay, let's go to curved space time because why not? Okay. All right, so uh, this I'll be a little bit faster on. Um, 
So of course, zero third issue is what are we even going to double copy? Okay. Amplitudes are well-defined objects in flat space, plane waves, momentum conservation, and so on. Okay. What is the natural object that we should even be dealing with? Okay, because there aren't amplitudes in, in, in general space times. Here, the, the really the answer was given to us uh, for the case of ADS in this fantastic paper by Hiroshi, uh, Roybon, and Tang, uh, uh, where basically they, they, they showed that, at least in the case of ADS, the thing you should be looking at are boundary correlators or Witten diagrams. Okay? Uh, and, and, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, so the idea is that uh, rather than look at onshell amplitudes, you look at boundary correlators. <laughs> Uh, uh, there's a dictionary where, we, while we think of plane waves as things that uh, uh, are annihilated by the wave equation, the analog of that here is bulk boundary propagators. The analog of a delta function is a contact correlator coming from just a bunch of bulk boundary propagators coming through a single point. And instead of momentum, we have control generators. Okay, it's an it's a intuitive uh, correspondence. What we realize is that you can generalize their story actually to any symmetric space. <clears throat> Okay, not maximally symmetric, not just maximally symmetric, but actually in the symmetric space. And we define something called an onshell correlator. Okay? So the idea is we're imagining a space, these symmetric spaces still have a lot of isometries, uh, not maximal number, but still have a lot. We can define a correlator, which I'll show you in a bit, where the linearized solutions are the analogs of plane waves and bulk boundary propagators. There's still a contact correlator. And there's a notion of momentum, which applies in curved space time. Okay, let me show you what I mean by this explicitly. Okay? So we have a symmetric manifold. So there's a set of killing factors, K sub A. So capital A labels those uh, uh, isometries. So those are different isometry generators. There's some capital F ABC, which is distinct from all the other Fs I mentioned. This is just the killing structure constants of the manifold. Uh, you can now uh, do something which almost uh, 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 look, looks like a kind of almost like a tetrad, but go back and forth between the regular space-time indices and these tetrad uh, and these uh, uh, killing vector indices. The essential idea is that we're going to map everything we can into the you know, space of isometries rather than space time. Okay. Let me go through this quickly just because the uh, details may bore you. But the point is, you can uh, construct a kind of natural derivative, which is, of course, the lead derivative in the direction A. You can write down you know, fields. You can look at the derivatives. But the point is, you can do this kind of replacement like this, where you have normally covariant derivatives in curved space time. And I'm replacing them with these nice objects, capital DA, which, which you don't see why they're nice yet, but you will see in a second. Okay. Now, the idea is we want to now build the analog of plane waves, and we want to build the analog of momentum conservation and all the good things we, we know. So uh, how do you do that? Well, you write down the wave equation. Okay. You build solutions, psi, which are annihilated by d squared. So in the case of flat space, this would be sub delta inversion. This would be e to the ipx. Okay, so it's a solution which is labeled by a P, which is annihilated by box. Okay, uh, now of course, uh, uh, if you had a plane wave here, you could take uh, uh, ddx plus pi, and it would equal zero. That's just the equation that defines it. So there's a, this notion of momentum conservation, which is that if you transform x, then if you also transform the label, then if you have another solution. Okay, so that just means that you can take a solution and boost it and get another solution. That's all that means. Now, obviously, all this is emphasizing that this is true outside of flat space. It's true for De Sitter. In the case of De Sitter, this is a statement that uh, the conformal Casimir annihilates Psi. This is a statement that the conformal Ward identity applies. Okay? So it all, it all holds because you still have an isometry. And more generally, for any symmetric space time, you can also do it. OK, you can build the analog of a delta function here, which is just a product of these things. But the kind of key point, I, I will go through this fast, is that we have a notion of momentum conservation, and you have a notion of an on-shell condition. Okay. The reason for this is that we have wave functions that are annihilated by d squared, and we have a sum on d of zero. What this lets us do is build the analog of an on-shell amplitude in curved space. Okay. So here, here's, here's what the analog of an amplitude is. Take an endpoint correlator, okay. hit it with the Laplace, the, with the wave operator, get the linearized equation of motion. This is obviously like LSZ, and then dress it with the wave function. Okay. In flat space, this is literally LSD. Now, correlator, hit it with box, e to the IPX, yeah, on-shell amplitude. In ADS, this is a wind diagram. In ADS, I write a bulk, bulk, like an all bulk prop, uh, a correlator. I hit it with uh, 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 the conformal Casimir, which essentially removes those propagators, and I dress it with bulk boundary propagators. So this is also a wind diagram. In the case of De Sitter space, this is actually a coefficient of the wave function universe. Okay? So this unifies in one line 
the three kind of gauge invariant natural objects to study in terms of the uh, And then we can write the amplitude, which ends up becoming kind of this delta function and then the same piece. Okay, uh, here are some amplitudes, just to be explicit. Okay, uh, the point here, the point here is that these Ds are like P, they're like P1, P2, P3. They have momentum conservation. Some of Ds is zero, D squared is zero. The only caveat is that Ds do not commute. So what I'm saying to you is that there does exist momentum space in certain curved space times, symmetric space times. In this uh, momentum space, the momenta are isometry generators. They have identities that look just like Mandel stem identities in flat space. They're just not a community. Okay. So uh, again, I'm gonna skip a bunch of stuff, but just show you now what the double copy is in curved space. It's exactly kind of what you'd think. You take adjoint indices and you replace them with isometry generating indices. You replace the structure constant and replace it with this, which is kind of a natural generalization in terms of killing vectors. They're, if you like, you could call, almost call them gauged isometries. They're isometries uh, uh, that are, are field dependent. Okay? And this mapping will get you pions in curved space time from cubic scalar theory in curved space time. Okay? You can just check it. Okay? What I'm saying is compute, if you like, the scalar theory, do this lift, and you'll just get the pion up, okay, a pion correlator. In, uh, in ADS. Uh, so, so otherwise, in other words, this formula, these, these types of formulas I wrote, you can actually interpret them as on-shell amplitudes. You could also interpret them as ADS correlation functions, boundary correlators, and you can also interpret them as uh, coefficients of the wave function of the universe, all related by uh, wick rotation. Okay, good. Let me now go to the last uh, part of my talk. Sorry if I'm running a little late here. Which is, uh, you know, I was only talking about equations of motion, which is actually pretty good. That's really just tree level. Okay. What if you want to understand anything at like loop order, you know, kind of very explicitly and mechanically? Okay. What's that, what does that mean? That means I want to build a Lagrangian where, uh, not, where, where it's not equations of motion that manifest this property, but the Feynman rules of the Lagrangian itself manifest that any uh, a four point sub diagram has its property. It turns out we can do that really explicitly in two dimensions. And this is where it connects with some really uh, uh, fascinating physics uh, uh, of 2D, in fact, integrable systems, which is there's a very cool uh, relationship, actually. This was uh, uh, noted in this paper by Jen Top, which has to do with UN, literally the generators of UN as n goes to infinity for odd n. Okay? And it's really just, if you like, a, a, a recasting of, of, of uh, this known statement that if you take uh, the generators and you write them in a certain basis, okay, there's n squared generators of un, uh, but you can write a basis which is labeled by p such that p is an element of zn, oops, zn cross zn, okay, so that's n squared uh, uh, values for p. So this has exactly as many generators as you need. You can write such a construction explicitly where the structure constants have the following form, okay. In this basis, the structure constants look like this where there's a capital N that depends on the N and then sine. So it's infinitely dimensional group, right? Yes. Well, I'm going to, for now, take it that, uh, take it to be infinite dimensional or think of this as a limiting case. Yeah. Although you can actually still keep N finite for a lot of what I'll say. But I want to just point out, observe something. When N goes to infinity, thus having an infinite sized uh, uh, rank group, uh, this looks like angle IJ delta. So this IJ is the spinner helicity angle bracket I wrote before. But here, keep in mind, we're not in 4D, we're in 2D. So all this is, is the epsilon tensor dot into two two-dimensional vectors. This is like the natural inner product in 2D, one of the natural inner products in 2D. Um, uh, so that's what I mean by angle IJ. And the point here is that if you look at the structure constant, it's exactly the structure constant of the Poisson algebra, okay? uh, which is really just a statement that uh, uh, diff two is related to the Poisson algebra. Okay, so in this limit, the kind of uh, uh, dependence on the indices i and j look just like d mu a, d mu b. Okay. Now, of course, these aren't kinematic indices. Okay, so this is this is me drawing, uh, uh, showing that they're they're similar. But the point is that this actually is a way of implementing the double copy uh, at, at a more primordial level. Okay, so let's take the color algebra story. I want to replace it with a diff, but I'll replace it with diff in a very kind of peculiar way, which is to keep the un. Send n to infinity and just use the fact that those uh, generators will just spit out the Poisson algebra on its own. Okay. So uh, this is the replacement now. So it, it's slightly modified from before, but this is appropriate to two dimensions. Take any color adjoint object, replace it with mu, take any pair and replace it with this object. Okay. So let's say we just do this for some Lagrangian. 
Okay, so we'll start from now the Lagrangian for Biodrin scaling theory. Okay, so now we've got phi, 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 there's a kinetic term. Okay. Uh, let me apply this once. Okay, so I'll take the barred indices and then apply the mapping I just said before, which puts a D, D, and an epsilon. Now you might wonder, how did I choose where to put the epsilon? Because I seem to have picked two legs to be special, but you can verify because we're in two dimensions, it doesn't matter which two you pick, they're all equivalent. Okay. Uh, but the point is we map this to this. Okay. So this should be the double copy Lagrange. So if this was Bidrin scalar, this should be pions and LSM. But it turns out this is a, a very famous known Lagrangian from, from decades ago by Zakharov Mikhailov, which is a dual formulation or classically dual formulation to the NLSM. Okay, so it's classically equivalent to uh, 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 the NLSM in two dimensions, okay, except it's purely cubic. Okay. Now, if you do this one more time, you replace the last color structure with more epsilons, you get this. So now this is a theory with no color at all, but tons of derivatives. This is actually the Lagrangian for the special Galilean in the literature. Like this is the Lagrangian in two dimensions for it. Okay. Now, uh, uh, here's, here's something I should mention, okay? Uh, 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 NLSM uh, and, and, and uh, Zakharov Mikhailov have these amazing integrability properties. These are classically integrable. Uh, ZM is classically integrable. Special Galilean is secretly free, okay? Secretly a free theory. There's a few redefinition that trivializes this back to d phi squared, okay? This is like a little bit like that trick I showed you in my colloquium yesterday. Okay, so keep that in mind. So the statement is almost like we're taking a theory, we're getting an integrable theory, we're then squaring it and getting nothing, okay? And that's somehow a little satisfying because it would be strange to square a theory and get a less, a less nice theory. The nicest theory you can have is a theory that is free. And I'm gonna make that more concrete in a second. Okay. But let me just check that the double copy is existing. So you can just compute the Feynman rules here. And there's a three-point vertex, okay? You can even see the three-point vertex is just an angle bracket, you know, angle one, two. So if you computed this diagram, there's like an angle one, two, angle three, four, okay? and then NT and NU are the others. They sum to zero by Schouten, Schouten identity. It's just a two-dimensional identity. So what this means is that at any order in perturbation theory, all loop orders will manifest color kinematics because of just kinematic identity. So this establishes, if you like, at all orders in perturbation theory in this class of model. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the reason it's all orders because you're working work out the relation between lab orders. That's yes, that's why. Yeah. That's why. Because I said a Lagrangian statement, not in amplitudes or recursion statement, because I can now compute arbitrarily. But all orders in perturbation theory, which is not, of course, the same as non-perturbative. Uh, now, uh, here, here's something cool. You already saw me map conserved currents to other conserved currents. Now let me do this for the uh, uh, well-known integrable, infinite tower of integrable charges that uh, this theory has. So uh, 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 the statement here is that uh, this is integrable, which means that it has an infinite number of conserved currents. Uh, we, we can construct them uh, using like the actual mechanics of Zakharov and Mikhailov and also Polykov and, and others. But the idea is we build a lax connection <clears throat> uh, uh, constructed from the fields with some pre-parameter lambda. You can build a, a, a Wilson line uh, from it, and then by series expanding in lambda, we get an infinite tower of currents, which are all conserved. Yeah. Now, I won't go through this construction here, but the point is the following. If you just take the textbook story, you know, not textbook, but like known results from Zakharov Mikhailov, uh, which is dual to the pions, and just double copy every step, as in, you know, take every adjoint index, replace with diff, every step works, and you get an infinite set of conserved currents for the Galilean theory I mentioned, okay? Which is why it's also integrable because it's free. Okay. So in fact, you get very cool things like this Wilson line becomes a Wilson line for a diff because the generator is no longer matrices, but actually diffeomorphisms. So you get an exponentiated diffeomorphism. It's kind of interesting math stuff here. Uh, but the point is all the conserved currents double copy. They're all conserved. You can check them. And it's good because the final theory is good. All right, let me, let me finish. And this is my last two slides with the kind of culmination of this, which is something which is non-perturbative, not in the quantum sense, but in the classical sense. So again, to repeat, in the sense that numeric relativity is not probing quantum gravity, it's probing strong field, non-perturbative classical dynamics. To what extent can we get the double copy in that regime? And I'm gonna show you the first ever numerical double copy, okay? So uh, here, here's what we did. So since we know the mapping, I can take a solution in the gravitational theory. Okay, so this, this is like gravity. This would be like a, me solving for a numerical relativity solution. Okay, but here I'm in two dimensions. So we can literally solve for like soliton scattering. 
okay? Because it's 2D. So we like put this in Mathematica and just solve for their scatter. And we know by the double copy mapping how to get a, uh, an NLSM solution, or I should really say a ZM solution, okay? A Zakharov Mikhailov solution. We take this uh, Fourier transform of whatever solution you started with, and we just dress it with the matrix TP, because I told you the mapping. This is some matrix, uh, which is, if you like, correlated and aligned with TP. Oops. So uh, this is the, the, if I were to draw the analogy of what this could be in numerical relativity, if we could ever do it, it would be build a numerical relativity solution, Fourier transform it. Excuse me, in two dimensions, there is no gravity field, no gravity, right? Oh yeah, except so we go in higher dimensions. Except yeah. for topological. Right. Oh, that's great. So let me, let me, let me address that actually. So it's kind of a separate question here, but a number of people ask this, which is, what does it mean when I apply a double copy in some critical dimension where the degree of freedom is gone? So don't, don't even worry about two dimensions, just 3D, where it seems like there's a confusion. In 3D, of course, there's only conical singularities. There's no dynamical gravity, except for maybe point-wise contact interaction. So what does it mean if you do a double copy of gauge theory in 3D? It's gauge theory interacts, but gravity doesn't. So what you'll find is if you take this in, in three dimensions, plug in three-dimensional kinematics, double copy it, you'll get zero. That's natural. It's natural, exactly. It's exactly what you would have expected. But yeah, thank you for asking that. It's, uh, it's confusing, but the idea is that the, the theory is, uh, knows enough to, 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 to give zero. Yeah. Um, but, but the idea here is that uh, uh, we're going to build an exact solution numerically, construct a putative conjectured solution, which should be a solution if the double copy is true, and then check that this is a solution. Okay. So this is just a function that we solve for Mathematica. Oops, keep switching back. Uh, this is a giant matrix, because T is an n by n matrix for large n. So I think we literally took like 199 by 199 matrix, okay? And we just dressed this and then ran it, okay? So we're a cluster. Here's what you get, okay? So here, sorry, I should label these axes. But X, X axis is this way, time is this way. So time goes this way. What you're seeing is uh, black and white is positive and negative values of a field. And the field in question is the, uh, is the, uh, 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 the label. So this is like, if you like a, a positive Gaussian and a negative Gaussian coming in, scattering, they wobble and all kinds of crazy stuff happens and they pass each other, okay? A kind of solid conic scatter. Uh, this is the second time derivative of that. This is the second position derivative. This is the wave equation, a uh, linearized wave equation hitting it, okay? The point of this is to show you that nonlinear stuff is happening. This is not just free propagation. Interactions are happening because this is not zero. If these were just free particles, this would be zero. The, uh, 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 the interaction term is this, and it's exactly the opposite, so that the residue, the residual is close to zero up to numerical uh, pieces. So this is me checking that my double copy solution is correct, which is that here are all the terms in the equation of motion and they sum to zero. And now we can even uh, see it, okay? So this is one Gaussian, and a second Gaussian, and they collide. These are various derivatives. The fact that these are wobbling up and down relatively large is the nonlinearities. But this more flat region is the fact that they cancel, okay? So this is the first ever numerical double copy. This, there's no specialness to the solution. I'm not assuming anything. It just took some random profile and scatter them. But the dream is that maybe one day we can actually do this for an honest to goodness, higher dimensional setup, uh, which is certainly uh, very optimistic, but, but, but not totally uh, out of the question. Okay, with that, uh, let, me, let me conclude. Hopefully I've been able to convince you that in, in the last two days that scattering amplitudes are a useful tool. It can teach us some things. The explanation for the uh, double copy from a field theory point of view for pions is that color goes to diff. That's it, full stop. Okay. Uh, I think th there's probably riffs and variations we can do on this, but I think that is a pretty essential statement. Um, uh, I haven't told you at all about gauge theory and gravity. Uh, 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 I won't uh, today. Uh, uh, and, and, and the point here is that once we understand something with QFT, we can generalize outside of one-to-one amplitude. So I would say that I think these features, at least in this case of these scalar theories, are not just some curiosity of scattering, but a much more general fact, which hopefully I've been able to convince you of today. And that is all. Thank you. That's the your second point. Uh, I mean, this pie and pie and these. Oh, so sorry. Uh, when did you publish this paper? Oh, uh, pi n squared. Uh, you mean the, the fact well, that- When you square uh, chiral theory. Yes, uh, this paper was, uh, 
It was an oddly entitled paper. This was probably one year ago. It's called Covariant Colored Kinematics Duality. The first half of it was pions. So oh, covariant color kinematics duality. So color kinematics duality, but with covariant in front of it. Um, the reason why there was a covariant there was there's a whole story about gauge theory that I did not tell you about, okay? Where we did not solve the problem. We solved a very cool adjacent problem and we ended up writing formulas. So, I, so this is the, the cool output of that. The, the covariant part was the gauge theory part. And um, we wrote down literal explicit formulas for every numerator, like a closed formula for every numerator in Yang mode. Like, and it's not like, the formula isn't sum over all trees. Or it's not like a formula that's secretly diagrammed. It's like literally a closed expression for all gluon numerators and thus all gluon amplitudes. So that's a, a cool thing I didn't mention at all for the gauge theory side. If you take those numerators and square them, you get all gravity amplitudes. But it's cool to me because we have a formula and think in our, in our uh, we even attached a piece of code that just spits out it at any endpoint because it's literally like a line um, just, for, just for ease. But yeah, it was co it's called covariant color kinematics. Duality. the first half was all pions. So it's 2021, right? Uh, 2021 or 2020, I forget. Uh, I forget which one it is. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, I think it's probably well, right. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, tw 21, 21, yeah. So I had a question about this. Yeah. Um, another place where you can get space-time indices or global indices is when you do a dimensional recognition of the graph. Yeah. And so, yeah. and so as some of these examples, could you think of them maybe as coming from a dimensional reduction of the gravitation? Right. Rate? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, I should have put that there too. So I've wondered whether this could be it because it seems extremely natural, right? The internal, the isometries of the internal manifold become the gauge group. Like It seems right. like we're talking about the exact same things. Right. Uh, it's possible. I've tried connecting them, but it's difficult because once you have the manifold, you're kind of naturally working curve space time. So uh, a lot of us have tried, we haven't made it concrete, but if in the end it somehow was some very complicated version of that, it wouldn't totally surprise me. Uh, there would be a surprising outcome of it though, which is that, you know, as I said yesterday, there's a way of getting from gravitons, not just to gluons, but also to pions. Uh, but that could happen. You know, you can get some yeah, from dimensional reduction. It's true, but also, yeah, I guess maybe with an exo sufficiently exotic uh, setup. Yeah. Um, so you'd have to find the right one for it. But I tried and I, I went, didn't succeed, but maybe that's a fruitful way of trying just like classic, you know, can, can this be just regular old dimensional reduction? No, no, but it, yeah. it's not regular. I mean, in the sense that the manifold has some special symmetry. Oh, I see. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah, you're saying it's not any paper reduction, it's a special. Yeah, yeah, because right. they're already not. Right. I wonder this, too. I think in two dimensions, it might even be possible because I think in, in low dimensions, like, again, there's no dynamic components, so it's a little, it's a little cheap, but in low dimensions, people discuss writing a 2D gravity as a, a 2D uh, nonlinear signal model with uh, a, a diff algebra uh, 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 as the flavor group. Uh, again, it's a little odd, though, because, again, there's no bulk interactions and there's no propagating loads mm -hmm. in physical gravity. But uh, it's something that I've wondered about, tried, haven't succeeded, but could be the resolution. Like, I, I wouldn't preclude that. I will preclude tetrad because that's not the operation, but just the notion of compactification giving it uh, might be it. There's one thing about compactification that makes it seem slightly different, which is in compactification, the number of dimensions changes. Yeah, right. And somehow dimension plays no role here. Like gravity in D dimensions, it's, 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 it's huge thing in two dimensions. So somehow the Ds are the same. It's a little confusing why that would match, but maybe it has to do with some cleverness with the compactification manifold. So I would say I would say it's not precluded to anyone I know, but I, I haven't done it before. It would be super cool to try, actually. Um, uh, I would say here's a baby version of the question, which is rather than try to get these relations of gauge theory from gravity by compactifying, what if you just start with Yang Mills and try to get phi cubed? Okay. That was like a simple problem. Right. Uh, it's like it's like one level down. Yeah. And then that might be doable. And when I tried it, I didn't succeed, but I, I yeah, maybe should still try it. Yeah. Uh, so on one slide, you wrote that for the double copy in like ADS, the analogs that amplitudes would be boundary correlators. Yeah. Yeah. So, so does this, like, are these related to like correlators of the boundary CFT? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's what I mean. Yeah. So is, is this related to the statement you made early on that like, uh, you can recast like amplitudes in the gauge theory in terms of the CFT, like a lower dimensional CFT. Is this 
amplitudes of adjacent and the low. Oh, that's that's actually different. Yes, the okay. celestial. Those are, those are yeah, different. The celestial. Yeah. So I can distinguish them based on the target space of the CFD. So for the for the ADS Witten diagram, the middle part of my story, I was talking about Witten diagrams, which are boundary correlators, and they live on the same boundary index. For the celestial CFT story, the CFT literally lives on like the theta phi angles of the sky. So the idea is take an amplitude. Here's what they do. They take a scattered amplitude, which depends on energies, E1, E2, all the way to EN, and then theta and phi 1, theta phi 2. And they, they just study these objects as if they depend only on theta and phi, and think of them as objects and operators on a two-dimensional surface. And they realize that there's an o, there's an o, there is an OPE, which comes from collinear divergences. Uh, 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 engage theory, and they interpret those as the OPE of some component. Now, of course, it becomes very confusing in gravity when there aren't correlinear differences. <laughs> it's like, what is the OPE for your gravitational theory? It's kind of confusing what that means because gravity doesn't have collinear differences because it has uh, it softened. But uh, nevertheless, they have this full structure where they study uh, conformal uh, uh, correlation functions of uh, conformal, uh, of, sorry, currents, stress tensors, and they all reproduce parts of the amplitude. So it's, very, it's called Celestial Amplitudes. There's a whole book now written by Andy Schwellinger where he doesn't just talk about the amplitude side, he also talks about connections to the BMS, asymptotic symmetries, so the memory effect you know, that, that is relevant to quantum gra uh, to uh, gravitational measurements. So this rich, like super cool linkage between the infrared structure, uh, 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 infrared structure, soft theorems, conformal field theory, it's like all a big web of cool stuff. Uh, I think we don't, Really know whether there is a CFT, but uh, people are trying to work out whether it's consistent. So if you're interested, look at celestial amplitude or uh, the angular band in the last ten years. <clears throat> okay. And more questions? Um, if not, let's thank uh, Chris again. Yeah, next few hours, uh, you can find him at the uh, at EBI uh, at the wizard office and chat more.